Welcome and thank you for joining the first Pro Literacy Book Club session. Um, knowing that literacy people are typically really big readers, we thought that starting a book club would be a fun way to get to know each other, share ideas, and uh, get the word out about our love of literacy. So we are honored today to have uh, the author of our first book, uh, Interred With Their Bones. Jennifer Lee Carroll is here as our guest. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to read the book. Um, in case you have not, be prepared for some spoiler alerts. Um, and if you haven't read the book, then we hope that you do, because it's, it's a great read. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. There will be a chat box to the right of your screen where you can enter any questions that you have for Jennifer, questions that you have for each other. Um, you are allowed to, you can chat on this feature with each other, with Jennifer, with us, so feel free to put any questions in there. Um, we will be asking those questions to Jennifer. She'll be talking for about 25 minutes and then any questions we will feed to her and she'll answer them. If we don't get to some questions, then we will send out an email afterwards and Jennifer will have answered all of your questions. Um, this will also be live about 24, or, I'm sorry, this will also be um, archived about 24 hours after, so you can go back and review the link or send it out to your friends if they want to get involved in our book club, which we would love for you to do. Um, before I turn it over to Jennifer, just a brief bio intro and then it's all her. Um, so Jennifer Lee Carroll is the internationally best-selling author of two Shakespeare thrillers, Interred with Their Bones and Haunt Me Still, as well as a work of history, The Speckled Monster. She was born in Washington, D.C., grew up in Tucson, Arizona, and she earned three degrees um, in literature from uh, Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard universities. She taught literature and writing at Harvard. Later, she became the classical music, opera, and dance critic for the Arizona Daily Star. She's also written a number of pieces for the Smithsonian Magazine, as well as a few screenplays. She lives in Tucson with her husband, daughter, and two dogs, and three cats. She is currently working on a historical novel about the painter Jan von Eyck. Jan um, von Eyck. Did I get it right? Jan von Eyck. Jan von Eyck. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, briefly, I had the pleasure of meeting Jennifer in person last April um, and really got a feel for her passion for literacy. Jennifer, we're so happy to have you as our first uh, featured book author today on our Q&A. And uh, welcome. And it's over to you now. Thanks, Laura. I'm so excited to be doing this, and it's particularly with uh, pro literacy. I can't thank you enough for inviting me to um, join your book club and talk to them. So hi everybody, um, and I will I will try to do you all justice. You have I have to say probably read my book more recently than I have, um, but I always I, I love talking about it. It's a passionate favorite of mine. Um, as Laura suggested, I have a background in academics, and for a long time I thought I was going to be a Shakespeare professor. So this book has um, a lot of my favorite quirky bits of history in it, along with uh, some great imaginative rides that I originally thought I would really only be taking <laughs> with myself. Um, so this book started a long, a long time ago um, with, in my, in my uh, hot house sort of a brain, and I, um, I was in graduate school, as I said, and, and thinking about becoming a professor of Shakespeare. And I was lucky enough to be at Harvard, and that was the first time I'd really ever been to New England. I'm from Tucson, Arizona, from the desert, and the first fall I was there, I went up to the um, to the English Department Library, which is in the, the top floor in a corner of Widener Library in Harvard Yard, which is really one of the great libraries of the world. And I was poking around in a back room, looking through all of the sort of older books that are full of dust because um, they're lovely books, but people weren't using them a lot. 
And I can remember it was a fall evening and there, there are these huge windows that were open. Um, so I was getting that crisp feel of autumn air and there was a bright sapphire sky going into dusk. And I found a four volume uh, Victorian bit of scholarship about the Elizabethan theater called the Elizabethan stage. And in this four volumes, there's uh, a, a bit about all the great, or really all the known, um, Elizabethan playwrights. And I, I paged through to look at Shakespeare. And I um, was looking through, and there's bits about each play. And I found at the end a section called Lost Plays. And I perked up. I can remember a kind of, um, just a kind of, a sense of electricity creeping along all of, you know, my whole body, my arms. I just, you know, it's like the hair rises on the back of your neck. And I started to read. Because I had always assumed that Shakespeare was so famous and has been famous since, since he was alive that, of course, we would have kept everything that he ever wrote. But it turns out that there are a, probably several lost plays, maybe, we don't know really how many, but we do know that there are a few, and in a couple of cases, the titles are known. And in one of these cases, we have, because of the title, suggestions of a plot. This is the play called Cardenio, and we have suggestions of a plot because it very clearly came from Don Quixote, which had been published originally in 1604, and in 1612 was first translated into English um, and was sort of the rave read of the year. And Shakespeare put it on the stage or a piece of it on the stage. And so I just remember kind of sitting back on my heels because it was the, the book was on a low shelf, said, sitting back on my heels and thinking, wow, what would it be like to actually find a lost play by Shakespeare? Um, and then, of course, you know, because this is the way imagination works, I immediately scooted over to think, what would it be like if I found it? And, of course, the obvious, the obvious um, consequence would be that I would never need to work another day in my life. Um, but, uh, but I really was more interested um, in the kind of emotional weight of that. What would it be like to actually hold something that Shakespeare had written, because we don't have um, any complete manuscripts of his plays. We have a couple of pages that might be a manuscript version of one of his lesser-known plays, but that's, um, they might be, they might not be. Um, and we have some signatures. That's all we have, really, that we know that are Shakespeare's. So what would it be like to hold the manuscript of a whole play? And then, of course, my um, conniving brain moved right over into, huh, what would it be like, you know, where would I find it? Where could I possibly find such a thing that, uh, you know, where it would have survived and where it wouldn't have already been found, where it would be much more likely to be found by somebody else? For example, a librarian in an English library. <laughs> um, so that got my brain kind of squirreling away, and I uh, don't want to give you too many spoilers right off the bat, but uh, one of the obvious places that my, um, the obvious paths I, my imagination went was the fact that this was a takeoff of Don Quixote. Don Quixote is, uh, or was originally, a Spanish play, and I grew up in an area of the world that, um, whose first European contact was with the Spaniards, um, and which belonged to Spain uh, for very many, many years. So that sort of seemed a, a way of contact, because I, I really I decided that I, I didn't want to just find it in the attic of an English country house or in the bowels of a uh, great archival English library. I wanted to be able to send my readers, well, actually myself, somewhere else. Um, so for a long time this was just a private fantasy and I would start to think, you know, well, where would I find it? 
And I was back in New England at the time and, you know, driving around um, antiquing on the weekends on the North Shore. I'd poke around in the old boxes and barns and kind of think, well, maybe, you know, I don't know why I would be here, but I'll take a look. And, you know, not surprisingly, uh, no Shakespeare manuscripts in dusty old boxes and barns on the North Shore. Um, <laughs> so I, I would also think about it, you know, when I was standing in line at the bank when you actually used to have to stand in line at the bank or at the grocery store. And um, it was just a way of passing passing time whenever I wanted to. Um, and I realized fairly quickly that... Um, you know, in fact, I really was never going to find a Shakespeare manuscript, any Shakespeare manuscript, much less the lost Cardenio. So it occurred to me very pretty early on that it would be a lot more fun to write a novel. Um, partly because, and this is a novelist's dirty secret, when you're writing a novel, you can control the world. I could then decide where it would be. I could decide who would find it, and I could decide the consequences. Um, so, and some of the obvious consequences when you start thinking about making a story or a novel out of it are that it would be so incredibly precious and worth unfathomable money that it just sort of begs to be part of a, of a treasure hunt thriller. Um, so, you know, then you've got a heroine, because of course I'm still in the middle of this in my own fevered imaginings. Um, you've got a heroine who's being chased by bad guys who want the, the manuscript for their own nefarious reasons. So I was having a lot of fun thinking of that. But I was studying uh, to be a Shakespeare professor and writing a dissertation and teaching and doing research. And this just kept getting pushed to the back burner. And I really didn't have time to work on it as a novel. Um, so. Uh, you know, so fast forward about 10 years, and um, I had written a book on the history of smallpox vaccination and inoculation, and uh, my editors really wanted me to come up with another nonfiction story, um, preferably along the same lines, that is, about a woman who changed the world. Nobody knows about her, so I could, you know, get a scoop up on her. Um, and she's changed the world, and there's so much evidence left that I could write it essentially as a historical novel, even though it's a history. Um, as you might imagine, there are not very many stories like that in the world. And though I combed through what I could find, uh, I could not find another story that, that had a kind of um, historical thriller aspect to it that really fired my imagination. Um, and, you know, to write a book, uh, especially one, I think, that has historical, um, a lot of historical underpinning, um, you really need to love your characters and love your story because you live with them for as long as it takes you to write the book. They're in your dreams. They're with you when you take a shower, when you eat your cereal in the morning, when you have time when you're driving around town doing errands, they're, they're in your head and they're talking to you. So you had better, you don't have to like them, but you have to be fascinated by them in my, in my experience. So anyway, I, um, I hadn't found anything like that. And I started to, I was getting so frustrated that I started to come through my ideas for books that I, all the ideas I'd really ever had in my life. And I came back across this idea for a Shakespeare thriller having to do with a lost play. My first book was a nonfiction. And in the publishing world, once you start either on the nonfiction or the fiction track, your publishers and your agent really <laughs> like you to keep on the same track until you've got a good record. Um, and this would be jumping, you know, jumping the wall, really. So I, um, the wall, that you know, that very careful wall between fiction and nonfiction. Um, so I sent off a proposal to write a novel about uh, finding a historical play by Shakespeare to my agent, and I expected to hear, what, are you crazy? Um, but he really liked the idea, and he thought he could sell it to my publisher, and um, lo and behold, 
he did. My publisher really liked it as well, and I was a bit flummoxed by this at first. But um, then both of them came back to me and said, uh, basically, have you noticed what's number one on the bestseller list? It's the Da Vinci Code. So, <laughs> and, you know, that's the, the, the best-selling literary or treasure hunt thriller of all time. And um, I said to both of them, well, yes, but I'm not writing a book in which I suggest that Jesus Christ got married and had a baby. Um, so, and I, you know, whatever I write, I don't think it's going to be put on the um, index of censored books by the Catholic Church. So, you know, I, 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 yes, I really want to write this book. No, I don't think it's going to quite me measure up to the Da Vinci Code. Um, but they were very, very keen on it, and I was very, very lucky. So after writing about a paragraph of suggestion about this book, I um, ended up with the okay and a contract to go ahead. And then I got to write it. Um, I decided really early on that I wanted to fold in the other great Shakespeare controversy, which is, of course, did the actor from Stratford really write the plays? So those of you who've read it will see that I um, spend a great deal of time, and I, I hope you will agree, fun um, with investigating a lot of different ideas about who might have written the plays other than um, other than the actor from Stratford. Uh, I did this in part just, uh, I think, out of the imp of the perverse. When I was in graduate school, it was still um, at a time when it was very unpopular even to mention that there was such a controversy, which, of course, in my young days, that, um, that just made me want to find out about it all the more. So I had spent a lot of time sidelight time, because we never discussed this in class, I'd spent a lot of time looking through various theories about who might have written the plays, most of which I have to say are fascinatingly wacky. Um, but that, of course, just made it all the more intellectually interesting for me. Um, so I was collecting a lot of the, the really out there theories and anagrams and puzzles about who might have written the plays, and I decided that I wanted to use a lot of those and, and other quirky facts about Shakespeare to be the treasure hunt uh, clues. Um, I didn't want to do what Dan Brown had done in the Da Vinci Code, which is to, you know, kind of to write your own sing-song clues. Um, but I'd grown up loving treasure hunts. My mother used to do really elaborate ones for my brother and me, um, especially right around Easter, um, in the years after the Easter Bunny was no longer <laughs> a part of our yearly, um, our yearly excitement. We graduated to having these, these great uh, treasure hunts, and she would write rhymes and hide stuff all over the house and the garden. Um, and so I've, I've just always loved them, and I thought it would be fun to concoct one. So. There I was with all these fantastic, great riddles and um, and ideas about Shakespeare uh, and possibilities for a treasure hunt having to do with a manuscript, and I and I had to try to put them together in something that made uh, sense as a plot and would engender characters that I liked and that I hoped other people would like. Um, so writing this book was an absolute joy. It was really fun, even though it was, I wouldn't say it was organic. It was, um, it was a very uh, uh, organized, structured way of having to do things. Like I knew, I knew I wanted to have a heroine, and I knew that I wanted her to be, because I had originally thought of this book, or this before it was a book, this was... Um, a story in which I was the protagonist, and I didn't want to make myself the protagonist anymore. A lot of people have asked me if I'm Kate Stanley, and the answer is, um, by the way, uh, I am all the characters in the book, because they all came out of my, my brain, um, and that includes the killer. Um, so anyway, um, that's a comforting thought, but anyway, um, so I, I, when I was starting to think of the plot, I knew I wanted to have um, an ex-academic 
uh, because I needed somebody who would know a lot of the academic stuff about Shakespeare, plausibly. Um, but I didn't want her to have remained an academic. Um, and when I was leaving academia, I had a chance. I had a fork in the road. I could either leave and pursue a writing career, or I could leave and pursue a career in the theater. I was very interested in directing, um, and I obviously chose the the writing path. But I decided that I would give my character Kate Stanley um, the road not chosen, basically. Uh, so she becomes. I decided I would make her a young American expat and I could give her all the wild success that I wanted to. So there she is. She's directing Shakespeare at the Globe in London and um, and it was just fun to come up with who she was and why she was there, why she was an expat, what you know why she left academics um, and and start to kind of try to lift a schematic character into something that was much more, um, uh, rounded and and had her own depth and and um, real life individual life. Um, her name Kate is my favorite name from of a Shakespearean a Shakespearean heroine, and the name Stanley is the uh, family name of the Earls of Derby, and that's where she got her name. So uh, she obviously needed a sidekick. All great heroes and heroines, protagonists of thrillers, need one. I wanted her to have a love interest. And um, to uh, uh, to balance that, I, I, I needed somebody who was going to be much more of a of an obvious swashbuckling kind of character, heroic character. So I came up with Ben per Ben Pearl in um, in the security industry, um, and that means as in guns, not as in you know business securities, as Kate says something to that effect at some point. Um, I, needed to, I needed someone who would know his way around um, or be comfortable in a, a pretty swashbuckling kind of crazy world. So that's where Ben Pearl came along and um, things developed from there. I needed somebody who would be in the theater world. I needed somebody who would be you know, sort of A-list in the, in, the, in the London theater world. Um, and I, and so there were some things that began very schematically like that. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, when a book takes fire, it goes in its own direction. So that um, the person who ends up to be the killer was not the person I intended to be the villain. Uh, and I didn't know that that he was the villain and the killer until halfway through writing the book. So I always get um, sort of secret glee out of people who, who, you know, I've had a few, a few comments from from readers that say, "Oh, I knew who it was within the first pages." And I'm thinking, you know, I had no idea who it was until I was halfway writing the books or, or through writing the book. So I, I find that really interesting. Um, <laughs> the other, the other character that I, I really. Um, uh, that I really needed was Athenade. I needed, I, I wanted somebody who was a spectacular, crazy billionaire, and I wanted somebody who was very invested in the world of the alter egos of who might have written Shakespeare. And so she was a lot of fun to, to play with as well. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, when I first really began to think of this as, uh, as an actual plot, um, as as has been common with with the way I write fiction, I, I come up with a beginning first. So I, I, I the the scene of Kate sitting on the on Parliament Hill above London with a golden box on her knee just came full blown into my imagination. I didn't know what was in the box. I didn't know what she was doing there, um, but I had that scene in my head, and I very clearly, um, you know, it sort of. Uh, an out-of-body experience because I'm not her. I wasn't in her body, but I was floating above this. Sort of, it's almost as if a movie's running in your head. So I'm floating above it, and I and I heard um, somebody in the background. I didn't know who it was, and then I saw, you know, oh my, I saw the the globe in flames. So in my head, um, so I knew that 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 would happen. Um, I like to write with endpoints. In, uh, in 
I don't know, in my head. Because if I don't have an endpoint, I can just wander all over the place and never get where I get somewhere. <laughs> I never arrive anywhere. So it's it's. Um, I often will start a story with the beginning, but then the next thing I, if I, if, I don't necessarily write it next, but I imagine the end next. So, um, so I imagined the end, and I knew I had Cardenio. Um, I knew that I wanted to end it in a cave, a dry cave in Arizona, places that I know I've gone spelunking in Arizona, and that's a that's a place that where something could, as fragile as paper and ink, could survive for four, five, six hundred years. So I knew that that's how I wanted to end it. And uh, at that point, I just had to get from one place <laughs> to the next. And that's where the great joy of writing the book came along. So, um, so I, and I knew I wanted that to be spectacular. There are some caves here south and east of Tucson called Carpenter Caverns. And um, they are, it's a spectacular living cave. So I wanted to combine a kind of experience of seeing what a great living cavern is like. And also um, to think about, uh, to think about, you know, it being connected to a, uh, caverns that have long since died and are very dry so um, and I wanted to involve some of I wanted to involve some Arizona ranchers I wanted to involve some of the western landscape um, and I wanted to involve the history of how popular Shakespeare has been and was in the American West among often illiterate cowboys miners prostitutes um, mountain men and so I was I had a lot of fun with that um, and you know it, it was an adventure from beginning to end for me and I and I hope it was for all of you as well um, I am getting the the um, signal that it might be time for us to open up to questions and answers so uh, if any of you have some questions you'd like to offer up um, I am happy to take them and thanks again for everybody listening and again if you, if you have no idea what questions you'd like to ask we'll, we'll give you a chance but um, I'm happy to go on talking as you can tell I can I can talk for I can jabber on for hours about this subject I find it fascinating I hope you do too I do Jennifer and thank you for that awesome um, rundown of the book where your mind was how long it took you to create this um, very very interesting um, we do have a question from uh -huh. full suspension marketing um, he asks does Jennifer write every day I do write every day it is I'm, I'm in a very lucky position where it has become a full-time job so uh, you know when when I was writing this book was before my daughter was uh, was born, so um, <laughs> I had the I had the crazy luxury of writing at all hours, um, and I have since had to really learn how to write in hours when uh, when you know much more set hours, much more like an actual full time job, and uh, you know when she's at school and when I've got. Uh, when I've got childcare, but um, yeah. So as you hopefully can see, I'm sitting in my office. I have an office at home. It's um, it's lined with lots of books that I love and lots of books that I'm working on, and with you know the topics I'm working on. And um, I get to sit here and uh, either stare at a blank screen or if things are going well, as I said, it it is like just taking notes on a movie that's running in your head. Um, so the hard work comes from comes between the blank screen and that um, that notion of flying and of trying to type as fast as you can. So um, basically, yes. I, well, I guess not every day. I I don't I don't work um, as much on the weekends as I would like or as I used to. But um, but I work every day. It's a great question. Lots of you know most authors have. Their own ways of doing things. It's there. There are no two authors who work alike. So that's always a it's kind of an interesting question to ask. All right. Thanks. Um, so this is a question for me. Okay. Um, you, you really used your personal experience. It sounds like when you were writing *Interred with uh -huh. Their Bone*. 
um, you know, you mentioned things from your childhood. Um, this had been something that you were thinking about for years and years. So I kind of wonder how, and it seems like that really worked well for you, how does that differ then when you're writing a nonfiction piece, like when you wrote The Speckled Monster, or I think the, the what you're working on now is mm -hmm. a nonfiction. So how does that how does that feel for you as an author? Um, well, again, I well for the speckled monster that was history, and I was trying to write it as much as I could like a historical novel. Um, so it um, that was an interesting experiment in genre. Um, again, it, it I fell in love with my characters, and I view it as my job to bring them to life. So part of what I did for researching those was to, for researching that one, um, was to get to know as much as I could about Boston and London in the 1720s. Luckily they're both cities I know fairly well, um, and they are cities that have um, kept and cataloged a lot of their history, and they still have parts of the cities that, of course, that, you know, preserve 18th century areas. So it was a combination of, for that one, um, really of, of bringing forward uh, a plot that happens to be historical but run along a kind of weirdly combined lines of a Greek tragedy and a, and a modern medical thriller. Um, you know, it was a great book to cut my teeth on plot-wise because a fantastic plot was absolutely historical. So it was up to me to come through amazing amounts of archival stuff and and really try to uh, shape it into, uh, you know, it was a bit like, not that I am like Michelangelo, but but I felt like, um, you know, that the story is about him finding his sculptures inside a block of marble. And I felt in a way that I had mountains of stuff. And what I was trying to do was um, clarify a story that was already inherent in the historical record. It just hadn't been really looked at before, but all the stuff was there. Um, and, and while doing that, I was reading through Lady Mary's letters, her own autobiographical romances, getting an idea of who she was. I was reading through all of the other things, the stuff that um, Zabdiel Boylston had written and, and all the arguments, crazy, vicious, like you think today's politics are vicious, you should see the 18th, you should take a look at the 18th century. So I was looking through all the sort of um, vicious political wrangling going on in Boston about smallpox in the 1720s when it was a dire um, public health threat. Um, so when smallpox was. And, and so I was really, and I was listening to 18th century music, I was looking at 18th century clothing and paintings, I was um, looking through 18th century cosmetics recipes through, um, you know, I was looking at what they ate, trying to cook some of it. So really trying to bring the world alive in my own head, in my own experience, so that I could also bring it alive for my, um, my readers. Um, the new book is actually uh, another historical, well, it's historical fiction. Um, so it's, it's much more like The Speckled Monster, except it's clearly on the fiction side of the line um, and getting, in some ways, more spectacularly fictional and fantastic. Um, but again, I um, I listen to the music. I in, I'm researching the clothing. I have looked at the um, you know a lot of recipes. I've I I smell the spices they had available to them. I have traveled as much as I can through some of the areas. I know what it's like to um, as a modern person to be in medieval castles. Um, I've visited as many as I can of the places that are either in the book or like places that were in that are in the book um, you know and even part of the book is in Lisbon for instance I have not been to Lisbon but um, but everything I've been able to research about Lisbon says it is very uh, like in feel to San Francisco and I know San Francisco really well so that gives me a sense of at least geographically um, what it's like um, and this book takes place in the 15th century, so you know, 15th century Lisbon isn't there anymore. But it isn't, you know, it's just not there anymore. So I have to use 
the scholar in me to reconstruct what a 15th century city was like and then bring it alive. Uh, that's where, um, that for me is one of the great joys of writing about the past. I am fascinated by the past. I do not want to live in the past, but I'm fascinated by it. Um, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm equipped to learn the history, but I, mu I have much more fun cutting myself loose from the history in order to be able to tell stories about it and do my best to bring it alive in, a, um, in, a, in an accurate way. Um, so that's, that's the fun of doing historically accurate or historically based books. Uh, so I hope, that, I hope that sort of answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question is from, and we've got a, a number of questions coming in, so um, okay. it's from Whitney. She says, what advice would you give to aspiring authors that wish to develop their stories the way that you have in your book? Um, well, my, Whitney, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would do is write. Write every day, write all different kinds of um, genres don't just stick to historical fiction. You should learn to write poetry. You should learn to write songs. You should learn to write ad copy. Um, you should learn to write academic history and know the difference. Um, and the other, the next one is to read. Read everything you can get your hands on. Um, I find the best training for for young writers is um, the reading of great fiction. So read. Um, and then I would say make yourself an expert in something, particularly an era or a place um, or a field of study, um, whether that's weaving or, or songwriting or piano building or, you know, whatever it is. Make yourself an expert in something that's the, at the core of your book. Um, and then use libraries, use the internet as a springboard. Um, don't just think you know the story. I often find that, um, that serendipity is one of the greatest um, artistic releases there is. You start with what you know, but you need to keep all of your feelers out there for the quirky stuff that is going to take you down a completely bizarre, unknown road, um, because that's often where the keys to stories are. Um, that's what I found actually in um, losing my earbud here. Um, that's what I found to be true in in all of my um, in all of my books. Um, in the latest one, for example, about the painter Jan van Eyck, um, I was not aware when I started working on him. I, I, he's He's one of my favorite painters, has been for years. When I first saw the Arnolfini wedding, um, when I went to London and was in the National Gallery, I literally stopped in front of it for I have no idea how long. Um, Jaw-droppingly beautiful and disturbing and fascinating. Um, I had no idea until I started working on a book about him that he was a very highly paid spy. Uh, and that's not something that's, it, it, it is in the record, it is in a few mentions about him in the art historical world, but it's not something that's generally known about him. But that opens up huge, crazy opportunities and vistas as a, as a novelist. So that's what I would say. Um, you know, write anything and everything, read everything, and make yourself an expert. Excellent advice. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Kathy asks, are you considering writing this as a screenplay? And I think she means interred with their bones when she, when okay. she wrote this question. Yeah. We were talking about that. Um, Kathy, that is also a great question. And um, I've had a lot of interest in interred with, the bo interred with their bones over the years. What I would say is um, while I would love to be uh, like an, uh, if it were ever to go into film production, I would love to be a consultant. I think, and I do write screenplays, I have written them before. I don't think I'm the best person to make my own books screenplays because uh, you have to be absolutely ruthless to turn a book into a feature length film screenplay um, or even a, a miniseries. Um, you have to cut things out wholesale and 
as many authors are, I, I am very much too wedded to my own book to be able to do that well. And I think another screenwriter would would come to it with um, more objectivity and that that would be useful. It is also highly unlikely that, um, <laughs> uh, that I would actually be given that task. By the time something actually gets into production, most companies and backers really want a proven screenwriter. It's, it's possible, um, but not likely. Particularly because this would be an ex the interpret their bones would be an expensive um, maybe to produce, if, you know, as it starts out with burning down the globe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, um, so I I, li I do like writing screenplays. I don't think I'm the right person for this book. Okay, fair answer. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Michelle asks, do you think do I think do you think that it's possible that there were alternate writers to Shakespeare's work? Okay, that is also a great question and I and I do my best to hem and haw and fudge it because I it's a question that I want very much want readers to um, come to their own answers with. So um, but the, the way I really think of it is this. The you know obviously Shakespearean academics are very, very invested in guarding that territory and saying it's ridiculous to say that anybody could ever have been Shakespeare other than the actor from Stratford. And then there are really a lot of, um, and there have been historically, many, many people on the fringes of disbelief. <laughs> I mean, you know, some of the really wacky theories are that Daniel Defoe wrote Shakespeare or that, you know, and he, he lived a century after Shakespeare died. Or that um, you know the the Earl of Surrey wrote it, and and he lived before Shakespeare was ever born. So, uh, you know, I some of it's just wacky. Um, the way I tend to come down because I like mystery, and I have to say I'm with Kate Stanley, not surprisingly, and Charles Dickens in saying, as Kate says in the book, I like the mystery. I do believe that there is some grounds for believing that there is a mystery. Um, I, I tend to um, alter, uh, alternate it like this, um, or, or uh, try to digest it like this. If you put the actor from Stratford on trial as the writer of these plays, um, if it is a civil court case, um, well, no, let me start the other direction. If it's a criminal and, um, we'll say, capital case in which you have to decide, you as the jury, beyond the shadow of a doubt, beyond any reasonable doubt, that the actor from Stratford did it. I would have to say, personally, that I come down not guilty. Um, and that is because there is the smallest sliver in the door, in my, in my estimation, that somebody else may have done it. Um, there is not much room for doubt there, but to me there is some doubt. Um, there is some possibility of doubt. Now I have to say that the most popular figures put forward, who are um, Sir Francis Bacon and the Earl of Oxford, are really non-starters. Um, partly because uh, of <laughs> death dates before Shakespeare stopped writing, um, in the case of of Oxford, and Bacon just Bacon left voluminous, voluminous writings, and none of it sounds remotely like Shakespeare, and that just would suggest to me that he wasn't Shakespeare. Um, uh, now, in a in a civil court case, which is more likely, in which case the um, you are trying to determine a preponderance of evidence. The, Stra the actor from Stratford is clearly guilty. He clearly wrote the plays. All the evidence that we have points very clearly and strongly, strongly towards the actor from Stratford. Um, that's who the uh, you know the plays say that wrote them. That's the name on the plays. That's who people. I mean, we know he lived. We know he was an actor. We know he owned the. Um, the theater, the theater company that owned those plays, um, it just, it, it, it is very likely, be, it is so sort of 
almost astoundingly likely or impossible that somebody else could have done it. But unlike the academic institutions of the world, there, there really is, we don't have a manuscript. You know, we don't have a way of pinpointing the, um, we don't have evidence left to us of the education that it would require to write those plays. We don't know how we can, um, you know, how he had access or through whom he had access to the numerous rare books that so, that the person who wrote the plays had access to. Um, so there are, you know, there's some possibility that it was someone else. Um, the standard thing that, that academics and, and, and the, the everybody who really needs it to be the actor say is that it's somehow undemocratic um, to say that it wasn't the actor from Stratford. And I, that's just silliness. Um, it very well could have been the actor from Stratford, uh, but in the case of uh, you know Marlowe and Johnson, who came from a similar, um, say, lower to lower middle class background, um, we can trace their education and we can trace their patronage that allowed them access to the books they clearly needed to write the the stories they wrote. That's not true with Shakespeare. It isn't to say that the actor from Stratford didn't have that, but the historical evidence of that has been erased. Um, it, it, it's likely, it's most likely that that historical evidence has been erased just by sheer time and erosion of evidence. Um, but it is also a slim possibility that somebody did it on purpose. That's my feeling. Mm, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, switching gears, we have a question from Sarah. Um, you might have addressed this a little bit earlier, Jennifer, but she says, do you outline your books prior to writing them, or do you just start with an idea to, and kind of see where it takes you? Well, um, I think it was Sarah who asked this. That's also a good question. Um, I, I'm not a fan of outlines. Uh, many, many authors are. Um, I do, however, not, like I said, I don't just start writing and hope I get to the end someday, which also authors do, even mystery authors. I don't, I don't know how they do that. Um, I'm kind of a hybrid. Um, so I generally start with the beginning. I move on to at least imagine the ending. Um, in the case of treasure hunt thrillers, they, I think they really need to be um, not necessarily outlined, but you have to think about things like what your clues are going to be, where they're going to be, who's going to find them, who's going to unravel them, and when. So, for instance, with Interpret Their Bones, I made a huge, uh, partly because I don't, I'm a, um, I, I sort of need 3D to, to see plots and to see all this stuff, rather than a linear outline form. and. My computer screen is not big enough to handle this, so I got a lot of five by seven cards, and I wrote down all the places that I wanted that had something to do with Shakespeare that I wanted to somehow fit into the plot, if possible. And I wrote down all my character names, and I wrote down the um, the the clues that I wanted to use um, that have something to do with either Cardenio or Shakespeare's identity and you know like the crazy idea the cra some of the crazy riddles that people have come up with that might point to somebody else being being Shakespeare um, and I I laid those all out on the living room floor and then I started moving them around and trying to figure out well which place goes with which clue goes with which character um, and and then you know as whenever I do things with books like like this um, my cats would come in and jump on the piles and scatter everything and I'd have to put it all back together but uh, it, it, that's that's how I do it because that's what works for me um, as I said I I really need it to be fluid because other for me if you if you outline it carefully and you know exactly what's going on it, it deadens it and the the most exciting moment is when it just takes fire uh, a story just takes fire in in my imagination and and I'm you know, I'm essentially, I, I know they're me, I, I mean, I'm aware that they're my imagination, but I'm hearing voices and seeing these things in my head and just taking notes, and then the characters start doing and saying things that I am not at least consciously controlling, so that, you know, one that I really didn't think was the killer turned out to be the killer, and, you know, you, when your characters start surprising you and going against the grain of your, of your 
well-laid plans, that's when you have a, a book that I think is going to take imaginative life beyond your own head um, and hopefully fire also in your readers' minds. That's a great question, by the way. Yeah, great answer. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and two more questions. So here's one from Amy. She says, okay. um, there's a lot of poetic language in the story. Early on, uh, flower beds fled past was one of the quotes. And two pages later, we had disappointed gray flats lumbering by. How much time <laughs> do you spend fine-tuning the words? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I'm a fan of Shakespeare. I, you know, well, that's, that, that comes both ways, actually, because he was famous, uh, at least Ben Johnson said he, he never blotted a word. Um, I blot a lot of words. Those two sentences just popped into my head, and, and some of them do. Um, I, if anything, tend to overwrite and have to pull back because uh, words and language to me, language is a kind of music to me, and I tend to hear it symphonically. Um, and then try my best to edit down to something much more clear. Um, so I do rework. I, I am trying and getting better at just letting myself spill out at, without judgment, you know, and self -cens censorship, just to get through a first draft and then go back and and try to polish and hone and, and clarify. Um, so, I, I actually do end up reworking a lot, but I have always loved poetic language. I love poetry. It's one of the reasons I love Shakespeare. I love Keats. Um, you know, I, I, I love Isaac Dinizen. I, uh, I love Faulkner. Um, and I love Hemingway. And all those people are very poetic in their own, their own ways. Um, I think most most people who strive to be um, great writers and great prose stylists beyond uh, the mere telling of story also are trying are, are poetically inclined and like um, like imagery and like it's not just imagery but also the sounds and connotations of words and um, the rhythm of of words and so yeah, to me it is is it is like composition. So yes, I, I work and rework a lot. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, last question is from June. Uh -huh. She asks, "How was it keeping track and keeping true for serious Shakespearean scholars? Had anyone called you on any of the details? Did you have to make much stuff up? How was it received? I guess by the Shakespeare academic audience." Um, that is a great question, June. Um, you know, I I come out of that background, so I still have a lot of ties to Shakespearean scholarship. Um, I think, uh, you know, Shakespearean. I, what I tried to do was have fun with a lot of uh, a lot of stuff in Shakespeare that um, is hard for academics to talk seriously about. Um, and I think a lot of them, well, I know, a lot of them had a lot of fun with the book. Um, and, I, and I did hear about that. Uh, you know, a lot of them don't, uh, don't give, certainly even give the very small window of opportunity I have for, con you know, I'm willing to allow for considering a possibility that somebody else wrote the plays. Um, and that's that's fair and that's fine. Um, so there was a, there was some nervousness and some disagreement on that on that scale, but that's part of putting a work out there and that that is um, both having fun with and deliberately offering provocation with you know with a controversy. Um, so in a way that was um, deliberate on my part and. Um, you know, scholars, while they can be very, should be very serious about their own endeavors, uh, most of them, I think, also are willing to have fun with their own topics. And that's where I think I managed to, um, to get a lot of support from the, sh the world of Shakespearean scholarship. Um, I, 
I did consult with a number of people on a lot of different on a lot of different aspects of this book and of what was real. I obviously made up some things, other things, um, but I would say the lion's share of it I knew. I knew, and I knew because I had been I had been trained as a Shakespearean academic, and I had also trained myself just out of sheer curiosity with some of the quirkier aspects of possible histories around Shakespeare and you know and and um, and now there is a much more serious academic interest in this all the sort of cultural stuff around Shakespeare and who's believed what for how long and um, so that uh, you know um, so that things like Delia Bacon's story are, are really talked about seriously in academia um, you know James Shapiro has a great book out on the Shakespeare question and he's one of the great Shakespeare authorities now um, so, so there, the whole that whole aspect is much more discussed now in a serious academic way inside inside the the ivory tower. Um, but again, you know, uh, most people, most professors of Shakespeare are in it because they love Shakespeare, and most most of them, I think, are are really willing and capable to have fun with it as well as be serious about it. So I was very pleased to see that. And that's really what I, you know, it's maybe a good place to wrap up. I, I really wanted to make Shakespeare fun, and I wanted to have fun with not only with some of the serious parts of who he was and what his books are worth, um, but I also wanted to have fun with some of the things that that had been taboo, um, and are really worth talking about as well. It's it was a fascinating thing that so many people. Have been so drawn to to somebody other than the person we think wrote the plays. That that that's a crazy cultural pheno phenomenon phenomenon and 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 one worth one worth mulling over. I think so. Um, you know that. I guess that's the best answer I can I can give to that. Um, I I'd also just like to say that. I'm really pleased that proliteracy chose. Um, you know, I'm really honored to be asked myself, but I'm really pleased that they chose a book about Shakespeare, in part because Shakespeare um, really runs the gamut in his popularity uh, as a storyteller between the elite of the elite in the academy in the academic world, um, through, as I said earlier, um, being one of the most popular authors in the 19th century American Wild West among a largely illiterate crowd. Shakespeare's a great storyteller, he's a great poet, um, and, and um, discussed well and given, you know, when you give people the strengths and the um, encouragement to have fun with his works, they can be a road into literacy and a road into serious Literate, literature and a road into question, serious questions about culture and everybody can participate in those so um, you know he's um, he's often now thought of as, a, of as an elite but that's not in fact the case and I, I think he's a he's a perfect road in for uh, a book club for pro literacy and I really think thank Laura and everyone there for uh, having me and having Shakespeare along. <laughs> well we're really really happy to have you Jennifer and thanks again for giving us your time today for answering questions and talking much more about the book going uh, in for a deeper dive um, and on that note um, you know what Jennifer said about literacy and Shakespeare being such a great inroad to um, exposing people to more books and more ideas. Our next book um, is actually recommended by Ruth Colvin, who's the the founder of Literacy Volunteers of America, co-founder of Pro Literacy. Um, she read this book and just fell in love. Um, recommended it to me right away. So I'm passing it on to you all because it also has some literacy ties um, along with like inequality ties and just a really interesting read. So it is called The Rent Collector and it's by Cameron Wright. Um, we will be sharing this on social media, we'll be sending an email, um, so we would encourage you to read that book. We'll have another session in about two months where we can hopefully do the same thing with Cameron Wright. Um, and we really look forward to that. 
and we'll also be sending all of the attendees a survey because this is our first session. We want to know how we did, what we can improve, um, so we really appreciate your feedback on the survey. And again, Jennifer, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much for your time today, for participating, for being the author that you are, and for making Shakespeare so much fun. We really appreciate it. Thanks thank again. you. Have a great day, everybody, and happy reading. Bye.